So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another outstanding photography at Google Talk. It's our, our deep honor today to host um, Moose Peterson. He is um, a Nikon legend behind the lens and a Lexar elite photographer, but he's mostly known and remembered for his iconic images. He was one of the first wildlife photographers to use the digital medium, and his pictures are some of the most um, celebrated wildlife shots um, to this day. And so he'll be speaking to us about his, his new book, Captured, and just general thoughts and observations from his life as a photographer and an equipment designer and just an adventure around the world. And so you can also follow Moose on Google+, Plus, um, where all the cool photographers are. And without further ado, <laughs> um, please join me in welcoming Moose to Google. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Google+, Plus, where all the cool photographers are. Wow. Hi, I'm Moose. Thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here again. Uh, I love coming to the land of innovation. That's a good place to, if you're a photographer, to go and try to push beyond the norm. Now, I'm not really going to talk about my book, Captured, because to be honest with you, if you really don't know about the book Captured at this point, or the 400 pounds paperweight that I created, my hour talk isn't going to get you there. In fact, more importantly, what I want to do today is I want to get you involved in not just photography, but sharing those images. That's the, the bottom line. Not putting them in some cloud or some hard drive, getting them out in front of people to do what? Change our world. Now, before I get going, I want you to make sure you understand I really don't take myself that seriously, OK? Um, it's important that photographers don't lose perspective on the fact that, you know what, if we don't make the picture today, guess what? The sun will still shine tomorrow. It's amazing. You screw up today, and you can still screw up tomorrow. <laughs> All right, beautiful, beautiful. OK, a little bit closer. OK, that's it. Work a little bit to the side. Yep, there we go. That's it. Hold it. Time for a close-up. Brad, need tuner F2. Can I get that hair adjusted, please? All right, the hair's looking good, looking good. All right. That's it. Work the hair. Work the hair. Come on. That's it. Give it to me. There we go. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yes. Work the hair. That. Oh, look at the eye. Give you have no idea how many people ask Excellent. us how hard Hold it was to get a bison into go. a studio. Beautiful. And I said, I work for the guys at Photoshop World, okay? Figure it out. It's not a real bison in the studio. But that's the idea, okay? It's to take what you might think is impossible, what might be totally outside the realm, and go after it. That's really what it's all about. That's what photography should be, a constant push of what you know technically, more importantly, what you feel passionately, and then put it out there for people to enjoy what we're really very lucky and fortunate to go out and see. Now, I do tend to uh, push that technology thing. I, I'm not, uh, I don't sit still very often. I'm always looking for ideas. I'm always looking for, well, what can I do? What can I like take people into the next realm and make them look and see things. And here's an example. Uh, I've gotten into aviation photography in the last few years for a number of reasons. The main one is the incredible generation of people who flew these, these planes and fought the wars that give us the freedoms we have today. They're, they're perishing at 1,200 a day right now. And a year ago, it was 1,500 vets were passing away a day. And with them is a lot of stories. And some of them are really quite grim. Some of them are just hilarious. And the biggest thing is most of these, these, these men we see today who are 91, 93, they're 18, 19, 20 flying these hot rods. So how do this generation understand that? Well, that's, that's kind of the one thing I want to do. So cockpits of airplanes, usually, you know, you got this is a, a $4 million Corsair aircraft. They just don't let the public kind of walk in the plane and play with the dial, buttons and dials as much. You know, one says rocket launch. I'd love to see what that does. But... That's not possible. So how can that experience be brought in? Well, first you have basic photography. OK, you got to get the shot. You look at it. First of all, you notice that in the very bottom right corner, there's a very hard shadow from the stick. If you're a photographer, you should look at that and go, OK, if there's a hard shadow. It means we've got a hard light source. How did the word hard come about in photography, first of all? If you look at that shadow line, see how it's a very hard, sharp line? That's how the word hard light came. Because if it's a soft light source, that shadow is what? very soft. There's no hard line on it. OK, so if you see that there in the corner, and then you look and you see underneath the dash, you can see the word Vought on those pedals way back in the shade. You go, wait, if there's hard light, how can I see back in the shade? Because you know anything about light, it knows what? We can hold five stops with a single click. Obviously, something's going on there. So in this case, we got some flash fill going on, all right? But OK, that's, that's the case, then uh, 
Where's the flash? There's the sun. There's the flash. And there's no flash over there. So my whole quest was to bring the cockpit experience to the person who had never seen it before, okay? Getting into the fine detail of the shot or not into the shot. So I'm constantly pushing it. What you're seeing here is 150 images. It's HDR, flash fill combined to create that, what we call a bubble, that full experience of that cockpit. So I'm constantly pushing photography. I'm never settling. I'm always going further and further beyond that. Now, you're probably saying, I came to hear about wildlife photography. People come in here about wildlife photography? It's the same as portrait photography or as still life photography or any other kind of photography because you're dealing with one very common important element. That's light. Once you understand light, no matter what you put in front of the lens, it's the same. The only variable between that light and that subject is what? It's really you. That's what most photographers tend not to focus in on is that it's you that's making the big difference, not the technology, not the subject matter. It's what you're bringing to that because as photographers, we are storytellers. And that's the really cool thing about photography. And every time you go click, most photographers don't understand this one important thing is that that click is the summation of everything you've done to that point in time. For example, if uh, we were to sit there and say a bald eagle, can everybody picture a bald eagle in your mind? And how many people have actually seen a bald eagle in the wild? So even though not everybody has seen one in the wild, they can picture a bald eagle. Those experiences totally, totally determine every time you go click what that picture's gonna be. Now here's the trick in the whole thing. You don't get to learn that right away. You know, I've been doing this for 31 years. And when I started out, I didn't have all these insights. I didn't do all this stuff. Like a lot of photographers, I did that really bad thing. I read too much. You read those magazine articles to tell you you shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that. When really you should just go out and have fun. And when you have fun, the rest of it falls into place. So with that in mind, I happen to have a very lucky um, situation four years ago. And I got into uh, aviation photography strictly by chance. It was not by design. Most of my photography has been by chance. It's just somehow I get nudged in the right direction and I have enough sense to follow it till it doesn't work anymore and then I, I follow another direction. In aviation, I've had quite a bit of success in a very short period of time looking at one single thing, and that's light.
So I've never done anything conventionally. Uh, everything I've done has been on definitely the unorthodox side. That included my delving into Bit Digital back in the day. Um, it's real simple to do a search. You can find some very disparaging marks about me back in 1992 or 1999 and 2000. I was going to be the death of photography because I was bringing in this thing called digital. Oops. So I never have done things normally. So right off the bat, I'm going to continue that tradition. Who's got a question? Who's got a question? Any got questions? This is where the participants in the audience stand up and go to Mike and not a one. People, there we go. Break the ice. All right, so I'm curious. So what's, what's the next crazy thing you're thinking about doing photography-wise? Next crazy thing photography-wise? Well, um, if you follow me on Google+, Plus, I just put up a video clip and I'm hanging out of a plane photographing another plane. People think that's pretty nuts. Um, but most of the things that I do uh, photographically right now, um, I'm not exploring anything, anything radical other than I'm still working with the VR panels, with the cockpit panels are, are called. If you go to the US Air Force website, they have an amazing uh, virtual walkthrough. And what's always getting us is the fact that not only is it these complete panels you can walk around, but somehow they manage the tag it so you can walk through and look at panels from every one of these spots. The mathematical headache of the, the HTML on that is, is only by all the photographic panels you have to build and then lace in to make that happen. So we're actually working on that. I might not live to see it, but we're working on it. Somebody's done it. Sir. Assuming that you've come to this point, when and how did you decide that digital had completely supplanted film? Well, when it comes to deciding between digital and film, the, one of the criterias was the fact that back in the day with film, you would send your precious slide into the photo buyer, right? And the photo buyer would look at it and say, okay, I'm going to use it. And then there's a thing called, and this is all old stuff, so I'm dating myself. You have a little Keymax sleeve on there, and they take their greatest grease pencil, and they figure out how big they want for the magazine, and they go to the art department, and they sit there and go, okay, and they figure it out, and then they send it down to the gorillas down the lab. Um, the gorillas are the big guys down there, and they have their X-Acto knife, and here's your cardboard mount, and they go, and they go to slice open your, your cardboard mount, and they pop open your slide. And hopefully your slide didn't go, you know, and hit the floor, and go, and then they put in this little drum, they fill it full of oil, and they zzzz, and they make separations. And then they send that slide back to you. It's like, it was a picture, you know? So that was the first thing about digital, is that uh, you can make infinite now copies, and they're still original. That was the, one of the first things. Next was, I did not have to go out with grocery bags of film to sit there and shoot a project. All of those things were part of it, as well as the fact that when it comes to sharing an image, as especially we know today, and it's only been a decade, sharing an image out of a digital camera can be instantaneous. So I can take people to places they aren't as fortunate to go to as I am, and I can instantly share it. Um, I'm well known for my The Office series that I put out there, and it's just quick iPhone pictures of places I happen to be at that I call The Office. So all of that, um, whatever reason, when I first saw digital and put it, it got put in my hands, it was, uh, it was meant to be. And people ask, what's the first picture, digital picture I took? Uh, it was my big toe. <laughs> I wanted to see the thing work, and that was handy. So that's what I did. Any other questions? Oh, Lordy, it's going to be loaded. No, no, I think it's interesting. I'm curious, how did you get into the, more in the aviation photography coming from the wildlife and landscape background? That's a good question, and actually how I got into aviation or getting into wildlife or any of that stuff, all kind of have the same general paths. And the first has to be, you've got to have a desire to do it. It's got to be a, something you have a passion for. That's the first thing. Uh, once you start following your heart, you'd be surprised the places you can go. And once you get past that basic barrier, there is, of course, the photographic barrier, making the shot, right? That's, that's kind of important. And then once that happens, all you have to do is share. It's uh, biologists and pilots and plane owners all cut from the same cloth, and it just blows me away how many photographers out there do not share their images with these people. And that's what I've done since day one. I, I used to have, back in the day, my own duping machine, and I'd be working on a project, and I'd have the critters, I'd get the slides back, I'd be making dupes and send those off to the biologists. Uh, today, it's a lot easier. The Epson 4900 is kicking out prints, and I'm sending those out to the plane people. Uh, and that's, that's it. That, that sharing of 
that world that we can do as photographers opens all the doors. It opens all the doors to people you want to work with, to people you want to influence. Copyright issues tend to be a big issue for artists, especially photographers. I had a photographer, or you know, finding a wedding photographer who will give you copyright to the pictures of your own wedding is apparently a hassle. What you want to share pictures, how do you reconcile that with copyright issues? Well, I'm probably not the the best person to ask. I'm kind of flimping about the whole thing. To be serious, we, I mean, when you buy my print, I'll sign it because people want me to, but I don't think my name's that important. It's the image that's important. So copyright, yeah, it's a very legal thing that we have in this country. It protects our intellectual, our intellectual properties, and that's okay. And if you're gonna take my photograph and use it for a commercial purpose in which you're gonna sell a product, then we're gonna, and you do it without asking me, we're gonna have issues. The rest of the time, personally, I think life's too short to worry about it. Um, yeah, everything's copyrighted. And that's just to avoid the hassle, if, if, if it ever does get stolen, having to deal with courts. Because as soon as I'm not spending time behind my camera, I'm not only not happy, I'm not making money. So I don't worry about it. A lot of people seem to worry about copyright, and, and I think there's more important issues we need to worry about than copywriting our images and, and enforcing it. That's my two cents worth. It's kind of flippant, but that's just the way, you know, I just don't care, for lack of better terms. I mean, you gotta understand, I've seen it all. In our 31 years, Sharon and I have seen it all. And it happens at least once a quarter, somebody will take one of my images, and you gotta realize it's, it's a 90K file on that website, and they print it out eight by 10, and they mail it to me, and they say, can you sign it and send it back to me? And I'm like, oh, I see these big squares on a piece of paper. I, I can't even tell what the hell the thing is. And they want me to autograph and send it back. And I'm like, do you realize that not only does this look horrible, you like stole my image? So. You, you just can't worry about those things. Life's too short. Um, they mean well, and bless the fans, but it, it's what they're doing is technically illegal. Life goes on. All right, let's talk a little bit about critters, okay? That's what everybody wants to hear about. No matter what you see, my, my doings and what's happening, I'm still a wildlife photographer. I always will be. Most of my work is with threatened and endangered critters. What's that mean? These are critters that are about to be extinct. Most of the time, that status of threat and danger is a political one, not biological. Uh, if it was biological, we'd have a whole lot more on that list and be more concerned about them, probably. I have seven species in my files that are extinct, as in, you can't see them no more. They're gone. And to me, that is absolutely criminal that in my own lifetime, in the state of California, where I'm a native, that they are gone. You cannot go out and find them and see them, because uh, it's not really ours. It, was handed down to us, and I think it's our responsibility to hand it to the next generation. And I have no doubt that I am kind of preaching to the choir here. That kind of, uh, I understand that, but you have the ability through your different mechanisms to put the word out there in very many different ways that we should care about this wild heritage.
So a real common question is, how do you get those pictures? It's a great question, very valid when it comes to wildlife photography. That's why I wrote a 400-page book trying to answer that question, how do you take these pictures? It's not like there's a recipe that I can provide you um, that can just instantly make things happen. What I can do is try to give you insight, hope, and, uh, and the possibility that you can do it as well. Anybody can do this. This is not a special person kind of pursuit. It just takes a big heart. So the way I try to answer that question, how do you do it, is just telling you some stories about how I was fortunate to be able to do it. I actually started off this little bird right here called Lee Spells Vario. Um, when I started working with them back in 80 and 81, there was about 130 on the planet. That was an entire world population. This particular, I, I've always had this in six cents. I can find bird nests. I can, I've always been able to. It's not like a challenge. I just kind of, like a heat-seeking missile, can just find them. Forest Service hired me to go out and find these guys, and they need to survey them. So the deal was they provided me the vehicle and the access to the place. And in the morning, I found the nest. The afternoon was mine to photograph them. This photograph here is what kind of started the whole thing. In that, the, um, in April of 83, California, uh, Outdoor California, a local magazine is put out by our DFG here, ran this article and this, these photographs. And this is truly an artsy-fartsy kind of photograph, not what most scientists are looking for. But in the article, I talked about this bird and where it was. And there's these two gentlemen down in Southern California, in Oceanside, and they walked together every morning. And they saw these, you can really especially hear them in the early spring when the males come back from South America. And they were always wondering what they were. And the gentleman had my magazine, came to his friend's house, knocked on the door, said, hey, I know what those birds are. And they go, really? And he showed them the article, and he goes, wow. And they go, well, you know what? That place where you see them down there, that piece of riparian forest we walked by, they're actually bulldozing it today. So they got on the phone, they called Fish and Wildlife Service, and that's who told them the story. And uh, there's a little clause in our Endangered Species Act, it's kind of a big loophole about destroying stuff when things get first get listed. Still hasn't been closed. Anyway, they, they did stop it. And, and they have, I've been credited from saving the species from extinction. That's how I started my career. Kind of a, a, kind of a tease of what's possible with just a photograph. Now, I do have my favorite critters. Um, there's no doubt to it. Uh, kind of obvious why my, my brothers in the north and I, we spend a lot of time together. They're very unique. They're very curious. You know, for example, that big rack. People think that's, that's there for a lot of things. But actually, that's a big giant radar dish. And they use those big ears. And they move them around inside that. And they're listening for one thing. And that's for females moaning in fall, you know, for rut. That's all that, that big rack is for, is to hear those moans from a long distance. So that kind of trivia has always driven me to go out and find out more answers. You know, the, the polar bear. Uh, is a, it's, it's an iconic animal which it's kind of sad to see what's in the press because most of it's not accurate about this information. The uh, timer up there photograph, and this is off Alaska. I, I refuse to go do them in Hudson Bay. This is up the Buford Sea in Alaska. And there was a, a female that drowned because her the ice pack, which a couple years before was, so a couple years before, this was taken in 2003. So in 2000, 2001, the ice pack is about 100, 150 yards offshore. By this point, this year, it was two miles offshore. Uh, and she drowned trying to get back in. So they are getting hit by the thing called climate change. And that has really kind of really changed a lot of things that Sharon and I do for the simple reason that uh, a lot of the places we have tried to preserve over our three decades of work in California, these little islands of habitat, people don't think about it much, but if the climate changes, these little islands of habitat, the endangered species call home now, it won't be there anymore. Climate change will completely change it and they'll, they'll, they'll blink out. Blink out's a, a kind of a hopeful term for extinction. So like the Fresno kangaroo rat, you're not going to see anywhere else but there. It's gone. Hasn't been seen since the photograph was taken in 87. So it's extinct. Can't find it. They've been trying hard. So that's one thing that we're trying to do with our mission is to not only, uh, you know, I get these phone calls, can you, or not more phone calls, it's usually a text anymore. It's, it's amazing how it's evolved. It, was, it used to be phone calls, then it got faxes, then it got to be emails, and now it's text, you know. And I just get this message, can you show up? We found this, we need you to photograph it. And I do that quite a bit. And that's where the photographic expertise has to come in. You know, you have to bring in the, 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 the camera and tell the story, not only biologically and historically correct, but technically and, and uh, communicatively very effective. So I just want to tell you about this one story and how things kind of evolve. It's how wildlife photography in my book should work and it's how it's always worked for us. 
Uh, I work with biologists extensively. I have since day one. They are the, the keys, the keepers, the keys of the kingdom. They're the ones that, uh, in seriousness, I don't have time to go out and sit somewhere and wait for the things to happen. It's just, in a business sense, that's not a good business plan. So I've been very fortunate. Biologists will say, hey, we're seeing it here now. Can you get here, here, and now? And that's what I've been doing for 30 years. So in this case, um, UAF, University of Alaska Fairbanks, doing a lot of work, as you might imagine, on this thing called climate change. But they don't do it in the conventional way. They do it very old-fashioned way uh, because of the, the head prof there. He's kind of old-fashioned. So we had a uh, PhD candidate, Haley, and she went around and 50, 53 years ago, this biologist went around and sampled all the collared pikas, which, which you see on the screen now. He saw the, uh, sampled the entire world population, which is down in Alaska, or Canada, all the way up into Alaska. And sample uh, means, uh, okay, take a skin, do the skulls, basic sampling, which is what science has been doing for eons, okay? That's, is, science is uh, as science should be. It's a very um, regimented, formula-oriented, this is my hypothesis, can I prove it, scenario. So she went back and with this incredible sample uh, from 53 years ago, went back and did it all over again. And what she found out was two things. The entire population of the collared pikas, one thing is a little bone in their skull, it changed. The entire population. They don't have facts, they don't have email, they don't have a way of saying, okay everybody, now change this bone in your skull to be this long. They evolved within 50 years to this one little thing. At the same time, they live at a very, very special altitude, okay? And that's because they're active 365. So right now in their world, it's 24-7 darkness, and it's about minus 30 degrees, plus or minus five, okay? And so they need this density of snow to keep them going. Well, that density of snow is the same at that same altitude. So the entire population, they all moved up the slope. They all moved up the slope. Uh, this is direct because of the change in the climate. They don't have, in the summertime, where they were, the warmth they need to grow the forbs they have to grab, and, and, and what they do is, this is number six, and he was a character. Now, collar pike is about the size of a uh, tennis ball. They're little guys, all right? And they live on talus slopes. Talus slopes are what you see a lot in the Sierra. It's where you have all that border, uh, bo borders and, and all those rocks and rubble on the side of a slope. That's a talus slope, and they live in that. They bounce around like a tennis ball on these rocks. They're just these, these they're dynamos going every which way, in part so they don't get preyed upon, okay? They're, they have no defenses. They can't, like, scare anything. There's, they're, they're commonly called rock rabbits, okay? They're cute, they're fuzzy, and uh, they go, oink, oink, and that's their noise they make, okay? Uh, they're just, there's one-of-a-kind kind of critters. We have the American pika down here, uh, which it should be listed. It's now in such a peril. The thing about listing it is threatened. And this is the collared pika, which is up in uh, the far reaches of North America. Well, the number six, what he's doing here is what they normally do in the summertime. They are constantly going out and getting greeneries, and they're bringing them back through this rocks, and they create hay pails, hay piles, just like you might think a farmer might do. Um, and this is uh, what it looks like uh, number six jumping the Grand Canyon, but it's probably maybe, oh, 18, 20 inches. And this photograph in print form is in everything from Harvard and Smithsonian and Yale, all places, it's actually around the globe, these prints have gone out because it's kind of like the, uh, what they've used as a mascot to talk about this climate warming because what uh, is happening is with that change in altitude, they only have so much mountain they go to and then there ain't no more. That's the issue. And on this particular mountain where number six lived, um, it was a small colony up in the Alaska range and there was probably about, I'm gonna say about 33, 36 coll uh, collared pika on this entire slope. They only had about another 40 feet, vertical feet to go up and then there was just sky. And there's no more, no more place for them to go. So we worked on this project. This is one of these projects where, and like most of my projects, they're all self-funded. There's no funding for these projects. The biologists need this documentation and their hands are full. They're busy doing what they do in their research. So it's up to me to get not only the photographs, but anecdotal evidence, okay? As a photographer, I'm not seeing things over and over again, and I'm not recording that, so it's a one-time thing, so it's called anecdotal. Even though it's a photograph, that's part of the process. So I'm out there not only to, to make the picture and record all this information, but then it's my goal to bring that story back. That's the whole goal. Because, I mean, how many people heard of a collared pika before? 
That's my point, okay? It's just not known, not seen. Well, this project we worked on for about 10 days. We is my youngest son, Jake, and myself. And uh, so Link, uh, the head prof, said, hey, we're going to go after a, a critter that uh, is in worse shape than the collared pike up here. And I said, really? He goes, yeah. And so two years ago, we started planning this three-week trip up the Hall Road. Many people have seen the Hall Road uh, trucker thing on Discovery. It's horrible. Anyway, this is the Hall Road, OK? It's an amazing. Uh, transportation corridor up through the, the Arctic, up to the Beaufort Arctic Ocean. And people know it basically because of, you know, the trucks that go back and forth. It's just a, you know, it's a very inviting kind of place. That's a joke, folks. It's okay. <laughs> That's okay. So we landed in Fairbanks. And at Fairbanks, we sat there and, and basically, after a year of planning, our three-week trip, because of political reasons more than anything else, got down to three days. That's all we had to do was three days of work. So we got on the truck and we drove. We went north of the Yukon River, and that's important because what we're going to go find is only found north of the Yukon River now. And we kept on going on up to a place called Slope Mountain. It's about a 12 hour drive up the Hall Road, which in itself is a crazy, crazy, amazing experience. Uh, what you see up there is just unbelievable. It's, it's not barren by any stretch of imagination, it's full of life, it's full of activity. And it's uh, a strategy for the critters and the plants to survive in this environment is really just a little bit more than the mind can comprehend that they do survive and in such incredible, spectacular way. So we kept on going up. And we we're going to the place that literally um, had just been named uh, on the USGS the week after we came back. And it's called Slope Mountain. Have you ever been to Alaska? There's got to be a thousand Slope Mountains. I don't know why they can't get past that name. But I can tell you Slope Mountain, you could Google it, huh? Google it, and you'll find all these spots, and you'll never know where I was. That's kind of the cool thing. So I, maybe that's what I do it. So all the hunters, and they say, I went to Slope Mountain, they go, uh, which one? And so we, we got up there. And this is, this, is the, this is what we found when we got up to Slope Mountain. Slope Mountain is, is there in the fog and the rain. This is late July. Looking through that fog is the Arctic Plain. It's an amazing location. Uh, you know, you're talking about everything from wolves and grizzly bears and, and caribou to Siberian birds that are, that are oversummering on Alaska. Now, one of the first things that uh, I was told about this critter, and, and when I, Link first said it to me, he goes, it's never been photographed before. I said, say what? He said, well, there's one picture. I said, okay. He said, it's a Sarah Palin story, OK? There you go. There, see, you all start laughing right off the bat. Anyway, they decided they needed to have an official groundhog for Alaska Groundhog Day. And there's four groundhog species in Alaska. So off they went in the goose chase to see which one was the most charismatic, photographic-looking marmot groundhog for Groundhog Day. It, it only gets worse from there, so I'm going to stop. But this one guy went up there, and he went up with the biologist I'm working with. and. Uh, he put his cool pics onto a spotting scope and shot through this fog and got a picture. So prior to us, that was the only photograph of the Alaskan marmot before he went up there. So that was part of the challenge. And then there really wasn't much known about the Alaskan marmot. Still isn't. Uh, a lot of the basics just aren't there. So that truck was clean, and that is the Alaska pipeline behind us as we head up and over. The Alaska pipeline is an amazing corridor, uh, engineering-wise, biological-wise. And the misinformation about that whole thing still boggles my mind. Um, but that slope mountain, once the, the, fog, the uh, fog and clouds disappear, and we're going to climb that thing. And we have to climb it when it's sunny, because that's the only time these guys are out. Well, that evening, and that evening being about uh, 12 PM, 1 AM, you can still see the sun on the slope, and we were good. It all was fine. We checked out the. The creek, because that creek there, we had to get ourself, our stuff across. We actually put a uh, rubber raft on that creek with a rope that we could pull ourselves across to get from this side to the other side to get up the slope. We had permission from Alaska to actually camp right there at the pipeline. There's our rubber rope, and that's where we're camping. It's not you know, one of those warm, cozy Alaska lodges you would think of. It is the basic kind of biological camp. The biggest tent is the food slash animal prep tent. And uh, from there, we just went across. 
And as you can see, it's raining again. It was pouring. It didn't stop. We had three days to get out and do this. And I had to have sun for these guys to show up. It was just horrible. Get out of the tent that morning, have our cool pancakes with bacon, and we, three days, off you go. Now, this is one of those, people ask me if I've done stupid things in wildlife photography. This has to be right up there in the top five. This slope wasn't just some, you know, little walk up a foothill, okay? And the biologist I'm working with, uh, he had tried out for Survivor, uh, the TV show, and he actually had won and gotten on there, and he was on that show, um, but when the, they started the taping and said it was going to take him into the season, he bailed from the show. And this is the guy I'm going to follow up the slope, okay? Not, not smart, okay? So I've got the 600 millimeter and body on my, on my shoulder, we're going up this slope that's about a 38% grade. It's loose shale. We're going up this thing. Um, Mr. Jackrabbit, he's on top in a heartbeat. I'm like, holy. And I'm at the bottom. Take a step, slide back two. Take a step, slide back two. 600, it's raining. Uh, my son's going up. And so the old man is at the back. Should never have been up this hill. But we get up there, and this is what we see. I mean, this is all we're seeing. There's no sun. Means there ain't going to be any critters. There ain't going to be any critters. But we sat there for five hours in the rain, hunched over anyway, because you have three days. That's it. Well, they went to the very top, and uh, their kind of shooting was a little bit different than ours, and they did manage to get one sample. Now, you might be saying and asking yourself, if it's possible this could be going extinct, if it's possible it's in trouble, why would you be shooting and sampling these? Well, it's like anything in, in the biological field. If you don't have answers, it's hard to figure out solutions. And without knowing much about the critters, a simple basic thing is, what do they eat? Uh, things like that. It's hard to make calls about what needs to be done on their behalf. And that's part of the project. Uh, and that's one of them. It's not alive any longer. How many have they shot in the entire breadth of this project? I think there's like number 13. So I like they're not shooting out millions of them. They take very, very select samples from select areas. And then the biology starts. And the guy on the right, he's the survivor uh, champion. And he is the, also the curator of the biggest DNA uh, depository for critters on the planet up at UAF. So his pedigree for knowing this stuff is amazing. And it's a lot they learn from these guys. But it's only so much. They need to be able to sit there and find out what I do best, that anecdotal evidence. So the next day we went out and it was obviously going up that slope was not going to work. I, don't, I can't believe I am here to talk about it. Anyway, so had to find another slope that not only was easier to aggress, because we only had three days, now we're down to two, but we had to find critters who would come out. So we went to another spot. Weather still didn't cooperate. This is all the Alaska Range, which is an absolutely spectacular part of this planet. It's hard to describe the life that goes on here. And the critters aren't what you might think. The caribous, they come in, they do their thing, they, they they love to follow that pipeline because the heat that's generated from it, I mean, that oil's going through there at 10,000 PSI, and it's getting shot down that tube. Uh, the heat that's generated from that is amazing. And the life that comes around that in the form of, of fur, uh, forbs and stuff feeds a lot of critters. But they'll come right up and just say hello. They have absolutely no inhibition to us, like you might think. So he just walks up. And I shot everything I could imagine up there from peregrine falcons and wolves and grizzly bears and caribou, but I still hadn't got the main critter I was after, and that was the Alaska marmot. And then finally, about an hour or so, we got to see our first one. Now, Alaska marmot, it's not like the yellow belly marmot you might see here in the Sierras or up in like Denali National Park even. They're big hogs, okay? They have been harvested for food. You'll see pictures of them underneath the wing of a Cessna, and they're longer than the wing of the Cessna is wide. They're big things, okay? They're massive. At the same time, they are the longest true hibernators of any mammal on the planet. Uh, their period of time above ground is, is just nothing. And in that period of time, like a lot of critters, they come up, they get fat, they make babies, and they go back to sleep. You know, that's, that's it. Well, so we got a couple clicks of them, but that's it. I'm sitting on the ridge looking, and that's what I did for a whole day. A couple pictures. So, okay, first one to photograph the marmot. Not enough. So it rained again the next night. And remember, I got to have that sunshine. Sunshine's everything. So we had to find another spot. And the next day, we thought, well, OK, it's starting off with a kind of a, you know, a good omen. So off we went. Went up the hill. 
We went up a different hill this time, and, and this time we had no threat of rain. It rained, it was gone, and we're out. And we're in a part of the world where even the, the satellite phones don't want to work. You know, we're up there at the top curve where there's no communication. There's no way of looking at radar pictures to see what storm fronts are coming in. It's the last day we go for the gusto. So up the hill that we went, and Jake and I went up to the top of the hill, and this is our view. And for three hours, we watched the view, and just watched the view, and watched the view. And the, cl the clock is ticking. And the day before, four marmots had been seen at this burrow. And we're like, okay, they gotta come out. So three hours have gone into it, and we've watched everything. I mean, we're looking down at the helicopters that are going back and forth, watching, looking at the pipeline, doing its survey work. We watched a brand new Camaro go up the hall road. Now, I'm, this is a brand new bright yellow transformer kind of Camaro that probably some military guy just bought in Fairbanks and decided to go for a ride. It had to be destroyed. I mean, the, the, the hall road is these big pebbles, and we've lost as many as nine tires on one trip up this road. So that Camaro was like a highlight of entertainment after sitting on a rock for three hours. And then finally one came out and had the opportunity of starting to actually do what it is I do, and that is to photograph the biology of a critter. That's my specialty, asking questions in my mind and trying to find out in the viewfinder to bring back an answer to biologists is what I've done for 30 years. Now, for a critter that sits there and basically hibernates most of its life, activity is not what it's really striving for, okay? They're like, it's a simple thing with critters, calories in, calories out, I wanna get fat, means I don't do anything, okay? Well, photographically, it can get boring real fast, okay? You're sitting there, you've been sitting on a rock, and, and we haven't moved, haven't moved an inch. We're stuck, because you don't know if your movement's gonna keep them from coming out in another five minutes or not at out, so we're just stuck. No matter what biological thing is calling on us to go, go off to find another rock or anything else, you're stuck. And then they come out, and this is what they do. Now, as I typically do, I take a lot of notes. I have a GPS in the camera, so it's, it's tagging all my images. That information goes right to the biologist. They can sit there and figure out where I was. And, and with our software digital probe, we can sit there and actually, because I'm using the autofocus, know how far I am physically from that critter. So they have that information. It's, 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 it's right there carved in stone in the EXIF data. But I still take a lot of paper notes. I take a micro cassette recorder. I'm taking verbal notes. And I'm watching and, and shooting that whole time. Now, for a critter that has nothing known about it, anything that we saw or we photographed was new. It was like innovative. It was like unbelievable. So how they moved across the slope, how the four of them interacted was all important. But really what got to them was, I was shooting this is a D3X, it's a 2X on a 600. I'm sitting there shooting, that's the burrow. And after a while I simply said, okay, I think I've got this shot. So I watched the clouds and I watched them then I put the D3S on the camera, and I shot video. I shot a total of about four hours of video. And the big thing was, everything in that video had never been seen before. They had not seen any of this part of it. Because biologists, the luxury of time to sit and just stare at something, it's long gone from our biology and our system. Uh, it's just time and money. It's that real simple. Now this, I've got here just a simple nine minute clip of all that video I shot. And that's because I'm in, I know that about minute 30, you're gonna start wiggling and going, okay, time to change the slide, time to move. And this is only nine minutes of my 14 hours on that rock that afternoon. That's what I do. I sit on my ass on a rock and I stare at it through a lens of critters, okay? Not real glamorous sounding, but this video clip became a, a feature in Nature Magazine. Uh, the whole clip went around and is, is gone from Russia all the way through. As people try to understand what it is these guys need and what is driving them to the point where they might go extinct. That slope mountain where we were going the first day where we camped, that's the last mountain going up the globe. The marmots have no further north they can go to get away from climate change, that's it. That's, they're gonna be possibly their last stronghold, who knows? And that's the biggest problem, is that there's, I can put out more questions than I have answers for, as well as the biologist about the marmot. Now, their biggest predator, perhaps the golden eagle, perhaps. They're not like numerous, they don't have a lot of enemies. They're big, okay, they're not like something that uh, a golden eagle can really easy deal with. They have these burrows they can um, 
go down into real quick. They're on these semi-rocky slopes, not a talus slopes. So they have some places to hide. But they do seem to like to stare out. Looking out to the direction he's staring right now, it's the NSF station that's up there in the Arctic that's doing a lot of work on climate change and Arctic critters. That's a big lake back there that right now is frozen solid and aircraft actually are landing on it. And what happens is, this is basically, who knows why, but they go up and down like periscopes. And all of a sudden you'll see the second one come up and then more importantly, you'll see them start eating grass. And that was the biggest thing that we recorded the whole day that got everybody excited was to see them eating those forbs because it was not known what they were eating. Uh, and that is a, an important part of any kind of critter's biology. So we're in about maybe four minutes of this video. I mean, people are like tired of it already. 14 hours on a rock. 14 hours. Click, click, click. 14 hours. So how do you get that picture? Well, you know, I wrote 400 words in a book called Capture to try to explain it. But the only way I can really be honest about it is the fact you have to have passion for it. It's the only thing that's going to keep you on a rock for 14 hours. A lot of people go, you must have a lot of patience. I said, you haven't talked to my sons, OK? Patience isn't part of this deal, OK? I get very impatient. I want things to happen. I want to see things go, excuse me, go on. But that doesn't always happen. But when you have a passion for it, you can stay there for a lifetime and watch it. Now, the thing that's um, it kind of intrigues me about a lot of wildlife photographers starting out is the first thing is you think you have to have a big lens. You really don't have to have a 600 millimeter with a 2x to do that. Why did I use that in this example here? Because it was totally unknown. We knew nothing about the marmots. There was, there was no research. Google Alaskan marmot. You'll see line drawings. You'll see very spattered little, I saw it here, kind of things, anecdotes, on, and that's it. It's just not known. So when you don't have a known entity that you can like refer to and say, okay, we kind of got an idea, we'll do this, we'll do that. So I can use this lens, I can go this close, it will, be, it will act like this, react like that to me. When you don't have the information, you gotta go completely on the side of, of, of safety, of error, of you know, worst case scenarios and start from there. Because what happens if I sit there and spend my third day and got no pictures? No pictures wasn't the problem, it was no data. I had no data for those biologists who were trying to work on these guys. These, the, you know, these video clips, they, they've gone over them. And they found all sorts of things that I would love to repeat to you, but they're all in Latin. I don't do Latin. You know? But they found these little, uh, little bugs and little things and little behaviors and, and funny tooth growths and all this kind of stuff in this video. They've gone through it a million different ways. And that's the whole point of a photograph. At the same time, uh, a lot of wildlife photographers, for whatever reason, don't share or give back. And that's another thing that just, it just seems to drive me nuts. Because seriously, what are you going to do with that picture on your hard drive? It sits there and then what? Right? You back it up, do a checksum every month, it's still there. Right? You give someone that photograph, and right off the bat, what happens? A lot of times, first thing you get is what? It's a smile. That's pretty damn cool. Right? And then they put it on your wall. They put your art in their, on their wall, they'll never forget you. And whatever that story is about that picture you told them, they'll share it to the next person. That's cool. And the next person, that's even better. So this whole thing that I've done since day one is, is, is something that I think, it's, if we're fortunate enough as photographers to go out and witness this kind of stuff, that we should have the responsibility to go back and share it. So we're coming up about minute eight, and some of you just got the wiggles like crazy. All I can say is 14 hours. 14 hours. Um, we were supposed to go back this summer and go back and work with these guys again. It was shut down, political reasons. We're supposed to be going back again 2013. Um, and so far, the politics are, are pushing hard, but I think we'll be back and doing it again. It's, you know, there's a lot of things in, this, in, the, in the, our lives that are, are, are forefront issues. Our wild heritage does not seem to still get on the radar scope, except for a few enlightened ones. So trying to change that is another reason why I wrote the book Captured. You know what I do, anybody can do. You just got to go out and do it. Uh, right here in the San Francisco Bay Area. How many people saw that mouse that was on a bus? Anybody see that was going around the, the uh, Salt Marsh Harvest Mouse photograph that was on a bus? It was a picture of ours. It was, it was taken just at Palo Baitlands, just uh, up the road from here. And in all summer, it was on a bus going through San Francisco. Again, just trying to get people involved in what's in your own backyard. Palo Alto Baylands, how many people go visit that? 
Shame on you folks. You don't have to be a photographer to go there. The clapper rail, have you ever heard of the California clapper rail? It's an endangered critter that lives in the Baylands. Unbelievable clown, hilarious to watch. You don't have to take a picture. And you'd be surprised you go there, how you get sucked into that, the black rail, the shorebirds, the terns, the gulls. And sooner or later, then you get into birding, and then you get to see it, and then you go, seeing it's not enough. A picture, and then the bug hits. That's what I'm here to do. I'm here to get that bug to bite you. Bite you hard, get you into any form, of, any form of photography. Wild photography, of course, is still my greatest passion. But any kind of photography gets you out there. We're the fortunate ones. We get to see this. We get to go out and witness that. So I think it's upon us to come back and share with those who are not as fortunate. Yeah, the video clip's coming to an end here. I know you're dying, but 14 hours on a rock. And I'm crazy enough to go back and sit on that rock some more, okay? They get back and bring back the story of the, the Alaskan marmots. It's kind of weird to see my picture 20 times around the room. It's kind of like, give me a little bit of a whew. Um, on the technical side, I still use, I'm a Nikon shooter, have been since the very beginning. I shoot the D3X the vast majority of the time. That's the big ass camera that shoots big ass files. That is about as fast as a crayon when it comes to writing those files. It's kind of like the old sharp shooter mentality. One shot, pew, they're gone. And that's kind of where I've gone to with my photography. I do love the sound of the D3S, that you know, nine frames a second, that's sexy. I can deal with that. But I'm working more at, and have been for, for many years, of getting that one solid click to tell the story. That means that if it's wildlife, or landscape, or it's a plane, or a person, the whole thing is to tell a story. And you sit there and have to think about a lot of things. Everything from the mind's eye. In this case, that brightness, that lake behind that marmot makes it pop out. That green above it gives it a place of, of space, as well as a visual depth, gives it, a, a for you, visually a place to, to anchor and see. All those elements of the way our eye works are all the basically the same. Uh, so you have to think about what's light and bright and what's sharp. The two main things that the mind's eye goes to and then use those either to bring your eye to the subject or make sure they're not in the frame so the eye is not pulled away from the subject. Whether you're shooting video or stills, that basic premise is in there. Next I think called exposure. Okay, Exposure to me equals emotion. It doesn't equal histogram. It doesn't equal blinkies. It doesn't equal anything other than the emotion you want to express the moment you go click. And my way of looking at exposure and looking at light is vastly different from other photographers. I don't look at those mathematical things. I look at those things that are important. How do I grab your heartstrings and make things happen? Because not many of you are going to get up to up there. You're not going to sit 14 hours on a rock on a hillside looking for something. And more likely, you won't have the opportunity to see these guys. They probably, you know, they're saying by 2050, they will blink out. They'll be gone. It's my son. Three days of walking up Dallas Hills, we did survive. It was kind of an amazing time up there. And that's what's waiting for anybody who wants to venture with their heart and a camera into any part of our, our globe and bring it back and share it. And that's the important part. Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Got to go to the mic. Um, I was just wondering uh, how you feel about HDR photography or also kind of doctoring a photo in Photoshop and oh, whether boy. You think that ruins authenticity. Photographers love controversy. I guess it's the human nature thing, right? Well, first of all, it comes to Photoshop. When it comes to my critters, uh, they never see Photoshop. What you see is what I shot, period. Uh, and I don't crop, no matter what it is. What you see is what I saw in the viewfinder. For, and this is my own personal standard, it has nothing to do with anything that's right or wrong or written down in stone. But when you're dealing with critters or history or biology, um, as far as I'm concerned, that click has to be valid. And since it's going to science, that's what I've had since day one. My landscape, my aviation work, yeah, I'll see Photoshop. Kind of know it pretty well and can do whatever I can to bring in the elements to grab your eye and your attention. HDR, uh, HDR is HDR. Anybody here know when HDR was invented? 1898, all right? 
we didn't invent it. We just made it simpler for the masses. People don't realize back in the day they had glass plates. They'd have a glass plate, one with the clouds on it, one with, you know, and they'd, they'd take that glass plate and they put it in their camera, and then they put the, take the picture of the person, and the person was under clouds. Well, glass plates have even smaller exposure range than digital. So HDRs, in many ways, have been around since the dawn of photography. And today, if somebody wants to do what I call Elvis on Velvet and it makes them happy, rock on, okay? Because this is photography. We're not curing cancer. We're not creating world peace. It's photography, okay? And why people have such dividing lines about that, but they have, you probably, you're all too young to remember things like aperture priority. You remember you know, when aperture priority came out? That was gonna be the death of photography. And then when autofocus came out, that's gonna be the death of photography, okay? Digital came out, death of photography. HDR, seriously, it's just photography. So I don't care. As far as my own, uh, I've been part of uh, the digital HDR since 1998. But the uh, way Kelby likes to describe mine, it's realistic HDR. You know, if camera can do five stops. At 5.1, you're going to see blinkies, OK? Instantly, you got to say, OK, that information, I need it or don't need it. If I do need it, what tools I have to bring the information back? You have underexposure. You have a split grad filter. And if you get up in the seven to nine ranges, you've got HDR. The only way you're going to bring back into that photograph the magic that our eye and brain can communicate. And it's the tool that we're always trying to measure against is this thing. And cameras are this stone cold computer bastard that doesn't want to get there because it has no heart. So HDR is a great way to get there. Yes, sir? Do um, you always only use the available light in your wildlife photography or do you ever have? Ah, I love the compliment. He wants to know if I only do available light or something else. Um, there's a lot of flash fill going on in the pictures you just saw. And I've been using flash since the beginning. And it's a very important part of, again, of, of compressing that exposure so the camera can see all the information is part of it. And then birds by their very nature, okay, the color in their feathers, it's the angle of incident, angle, angle reflection. Okay, so their whole feathers, the way they all are different species are, is to show themselves off with that color. And if you want to show all that color off in a photograph and you only have one light source, the sun, or no light source, the flash is the way to do it. So, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, I realize this is more of a question for the biologist you work with, but um, the marmots, not knowing how many existed, how you know anything about them, what what was learned from the the samples taken that couldn't have been learned from a live capture with the radio collar and a blood sample and a fecal sample? Well, it's a valid question. What can we learn from a, a dead specimen versus the rest? Well, first and foremost is it's called money. So a live capture, you know, you're talking about minimum one day, $800 to $2,000, one person live capture, okay? I don't know if you know, but money's like tight, and no one gives a squat about Alaska marmots. So getting funding for, for just our three days to go out and look at survey work was impossible to do. That's the first re real world answer to that question. And then next, um, having a marked population works when you have a population that you can actually deal with. And you're talking about critters who, for basically two and a half months out of the year, other than that, you can't get to them. So that marked population isn't going to work. And then lastly is technology. When you're working with a critter that's living in minus 30, minus 40, batteries and a portable device that fits around a neck or implanted in the abdomen, we don't have that kind of viable technology. So there's a lot of, a lot of technical issues as well as everything else. Um, John James Audubon, Audubon. Everybody know about the artist. John James Audubon. Everybody know who he is? You know he shot everything he painted? Okay. It's, 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 a, it's a lineage in, in science. There's a recipe that if you're a scientist and you have to prove your point, you can go, I went and followed this regiment, this regiment, this protocol, this protocol. And so then if you did all those things and you make this conclusion, then the logic and the, the facts can't be argued, so that must be accurate. So that's part of the science regime as well. Um, like I said, the number of specimens they've, they've, they've shot is nothing compared to the world population. And in this, this day and time, it's the only way we're gonna get answers, especially probably in a, in a period of time we have allotted to us. Yeah. Thank you. I know. It's a cute little thing that got shot. You'd be surprised how many deer in the, East, in the Eastern Sierras are run over every year, you know, that because of our cars, and that's not even the name of science. So it does seem cruel, but that's the process. And to be honest with you, if a scientist 53 years ago had not sampled all those colored pica, 
If he hadn't done that, and those bone collections weren't in the Smithsonian, Harvard, Yale, uh, Berkeley, if those specimens weren't here for us to look at, there's no way that Haley could have gone now and said that bone changed. And everybody goes, and there's proof. So there's the, the flip side too. And without that proof, that whole thing would not have opened up and a whole nother star study of science as far as climate change would have progressed. So it's, it's, it's the hard facts and yeah, I know it's cute and it's dead, but there's a reason. All right, I have two questions. First one is you talk about knowing what the story you want to tell when you take your pictures. How often does your story develop while you're taking the picture, while you're looking at the critter, and how much is it before you even start climbing the mountain, you know what you want to shoot? It's a great question. Um, I first of all do all the homework I can on anything I'm about to work on. So I have a basic idea of what I want to photograph and how I want to say it. Now, do the photo gods always provide it, and does Mother Nature always cooperate? No. You know, going out and getting skunked is a big part of it. That's why I sat on a rock for 14 hours, okay? Um, that's part of the process. When everything does fall in place like you hope it will, then most of the time my preconceived ideas of how I want to tell a story will fall into place. And that's what allows me to go up that mountain with just the, the minimal camera gear I need to get the job done, for example. So I don't walk up the hill with a backpack full of gear. Not only does it beat you down, but by the time you get up there, it's so clumsy that you are probably going to scare something off. So it's, it's very much part of the process. At the same time, solving problems is very much part of photography. You've got to be able to do it. The other question is, which organization have you found to be effective in helping us preserve the wild, uh, the wild heritage we have? Can we turn off the camera for a second? I'm kidding. Uh, be serious, very few. They all have a good heart, but the word compromise is not in the system. It's just not out there. Um, and it's very disheartening. Uh, a lot of times the information, I work a lot behind the scenes anymore. Uh, and it's, it's very disheartening because no one can compromise. And it's like, it's like I want to grab them. I go, do you realize things are disappearing while you argue over this? It's like, seriously, there, we can compromise. You don't have to lock everything up be, you know, behind walls. We don't have to bulldoze it all either. There is a lot of avenues proven you know, in the data that would work. And, Compromise is difficult. Well, I know it's getting around time. Let me just leave you with one last thing. Um, I showed you a little bit of my aviation work, showed you some critters. I also do that thing called uh, landscape photography, which, you know, you're out photographing critters. You can't help but see some of the most amazing spots on this planet. And often when you sit on a rock for 14 hours, something good tends to happen out there. And uh, that's kind of what generates my, my landscape photography. And I just want to just leave you one last note that um, you can make a difference.
want to thank Cliff and Mike for having me here, and I'll be around if you have any questions. Have a great weekend, folks.